Emin, the live stream has started. Thank you very much, Angela. Very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this extraordinary meeting of Cornwall Council Standards Committee, which is being held on Thursday, the 4th of March, which is St. Piran's Eve. So I'm sure we're all aware tomorrow being the big day, uh, being held at two o'clock. This, this is a online virtual meeting. Before we start the meeting, I will outline for you the protocols uh, for this meeting. Uh, Today's meeting is being live streamed to the public via Microsoft Teams and is also being recorded. If the Council's live stream fails during the meeting and we cannot share the proceedings, I will adjourn the meeting so that access can be restored. If the issue cannot be resolved, I'll halt the meeting and the remaining many business will be concluded at a future date. If a member experiences a technical issue, I will adjourn for a short, adjourn for a short period uh, to try and re-establish their connection. If you do have an issue, the helpline number is 01872 324498. As I, call, I as I call a member to speak, I'll remind you to switch on your microphone. If for some reason you cannot be heard, the Democratic officer will advise you. I will indicate when we're going to move to a vote. The Democratic Services officer will declare the result. We do not have any public participation in today's meeting. However, the public can watch the proceedings by accessing the live stream via the link on the Council's agenda website. Where a member has declared a non registrable interest, a disclosable pecuniary interest, or any interest by virtue of a trade union membership in any matter, they must leave the virtual meeting. Their departure will be confirmed and they'll be invited to rejoin the meeting at the appropriate time. Should the press and public be excluded from the meeting, members will be required to turn in turn to confirm and declare that there are no other persons present who are not entitled to either hear or see consideration of the matter. We do not uh, intend to go into closed session today as we have nothing on the agenda uh, that warrants us doing so. To confirm the procedure for today's meeting um, is that committee members who wish to speak, they should indicate by putting an X in the chat box. Before we start the meeting, I'll ask the Democratic Service Officer to ask committee members to confirm they are present with their electoral division. For non-elected members, they will need to confirm their name and their role on the committee. As an example, an independent member, parish or town council representative or clerk representative. Um, I'll ask Angela to do that now for us, please, Angela. Um, thanks, Chairman. I'll start with you as you're the chair of the committee. Thank you. I'm Councillor Paul Wilson, Colour Major Electoral Division Chair of Cornwall Council Standards Committee. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jenkin. Thank you. Uh, Loveday Jenkin, um, Crown and Wendron Division. I'm um, Vice Chair of Cornwall Standards Committee. Thank you. Councillor Frank. Good afternoon. I'm Hilary Frank. I represent the good folk of Saltash South. Councillor Nicholas. Good afternoon, uh, Sue Nicholas representing Marazine and Perinus No Division. Mm -hmm. Councillor Pugh. Good afternoon, I'm Richard Pugh and I represent the Trelawney Division. Thank you. I'll move on to the independent members. Robert Bishop. Uh, You've missed me, Angela. Oh, sorry, I did that again. Sorry, Councillor Alvey. If you could introduce yourself. So, uh, Martin Alvey, <laughs> Councillor for Fioc and Plain Place. Thank you. Uh, Robert Bishop. Rob Bishop, independent member. Thank you. Reg Davison. Reg Davison, also an independent member. Thank you. Um, Professor Merrill Dean. Merrill Dean, an independent member. Councillor Challen. Gloria Challen, Siltash Town Council. Uh, Councillor David Edwards. Um, Dave Edwards, you're on mute at the moment. I'll move on a moment. Um, Hugh Wood. Hello. Uh, can, I'm uh, Parish Council representative from Millbrook Parish Council. Thank you. Tony Woodhams. Uh, Tony Woodhams, uh, Parish representative, Bree Parish Council. Sally Vincent. Mm -hmm. Sally Vincent, Town Parish Clerk Representative. Thank you. I'll just try David Edwards again. Well, 
we do have Dave Eggers, our president. He's a parish town council representative on the committee. I'll just um, move on to the officers that are present. We have Simon Mansell, the corporate and information governance manager, Ellie Garraway, the corporate governance officer, um, Suzanne Wixey, service director from adult care and support, Judith Field from customer is the customer standards lead, and there's myself, Angela Saunders from Democratic Services. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Angela. Um, on to the agenda then, and uh, item number one is apologies for absence, please, Angela. Yes, I've had apologies from councillors Gammon and Tudor. Thank you. Declaration of interest in accordance with the agenda. Any members please have a uh, declaration of interest they wish to bring to the attention of the committee. If you do, then please put uh, an X in the box and we will come to you. I can see that Dave Edwards is back in on the meeting. So while we're just very waiting to see if anyone's got an interest, Dave, are you okay? Can you hear us all okay, Dave? Yes, I can, thank you. That's wonderful, thank you, that's great. I see no declaration of interest X's in the box or no hands raised. So we'll go on to item number three, which is the code of conduct. This is in your packs pages three to nine. As I'm sure you're all aware, a working party was set up to look at a new code of conduct um, and it was chaired by the vice chair of the committee, Councillor Jenkin. And Councillor Jenkin, I'll invite you to take the floor first of all before we hear from the corporate governance manager, Simon Mansell. Councillor Jenkin. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, this has been a tight time scale to try and get this all through in terms of getting it uh, approved before we go into election mode. But the working party met on the 21st of December, which was very um, good of them to look at the amended code. Um, and the consultation started in early January and they met again in February to consider the responses on the 22nd of February. So I'd like to thank all the members of that working group who worked really hard to dot the I's and cross the T's. As was reported at the um, previous standards committee held in January, um, the decision was made that actually we had a very good code already and it just needed a few tweaks to make it um, even better. But I'm sure Simon will go through those um, detailed changes. Um, most of the, the report, most of the um, consultation was uh, very positive, but I'll, I'll pass it on to Simon. But uh, really just to say thank you to the working group. And the one thing we did pick up and we would like to recommend is that um, a few members were concerned about how they dealt with people disrespecting and bullying them and the council has a different code which is about um, a guide to dealing with intimidation and the suggestion is that um, in the new authority it would be a good idea for the a standards committee working group to look at that because the code of conduct for members is only about members conduct. Thank you Jack. Thank you very much, Councillor Jenkin. Yes, I know that we uh, we did look at harassment and bullying procedures um, and in fact a pocket sized guide and a full guide was sent to all members and to parish and town clerks for dissemination to uh, parish and town council members as well. But it's always a good thing to look at these things and to revise, revise them and see what else can be done um, to help and assist members should they feel they are being bullied or intimidated. Uh, to Simon Mansell, now the Corporate Governance Manager on the Code of Conduct, Simon. Thank you, thank you Mr Chairman. I'm just going to try to make sure I get the right um, background effects on a moment. Mm -hmm. um, you've got us all intrigued now. We're all waiting to see what background effects you've got now, Simon. It's nothing terribly exciting, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> With regards to the uh, last point first, um, the, the working group when they considered the code and then we dis they discussed the um, guide to intimidation. Um, I have um, taken the liberty of putting that into the work plan that will come before the standards committee when it meets in April. So the standards committee can then consider if they want to um, set that into the work plan for the following year, starting with the meeting in July. Um, with regards to the code of conduct overall, um, even though we only had 2025 responses. This was actually some of the best responses we've ever had to a consultation. Um, 
the majority um, supported the changes. Um, one council did say they preferred the LGA model, um, yeah, which which is their preference. Um, mostly, as uh, Councillor Jenkins has uh, come said, the, the, it was very positive. I had conversations with several clerks on the side as well, um, and the you know the, the general feeling from them was, and their members was, don't change it because our members know it, and that was really what the working group had felt anyway, and uh, when they discussed the code. The main thing that uh, raised um, an issue of a point of conversation, should we say, uh, was the training requirements for um, town and parish councillors and Cornwall councillors and who then, how often should they undergo the training and who should monitor it. There was a slight then amendment to the code, uh, which is set out, um, if I can get my internet started, in, um, within the code itself. Um, Two years because there was they didn't feel they didn't want to put an undue burden on clerks. Um, with regards to the code as it is, this is what will go to Cornwall Council for approval, uh, and that will be hopefully if they accept it will be approved at the end of March, and we will then send this code out to all town and parish councils for them to consider recommending to their members. Um, I would say in closing that a couple of councils have already adopted um, this code of conduct. They felt that they would just do it there and then. So well, we already have this slightly amended code in use uh, around Cornwall. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions on the code or the report. Thank you, Simon. Uh, anyone, any questions for Simon then please, please indicate by putting an X in the box um, or by using the raise your hand feature. Uh, I can see that Tony Woodhams uh, is the first to ask a question. Tony. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairman. It, uh, just a couple of points, really. I looked through both the codes and I understand that this is going out first off initially for Cornwall Council's approval, and then it will come to the parishes to see if they want to adopt it or stay with the LGA1 or whichever way they want to do. This one um, is adopted today. In sections uh, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15 um, don't apply to parish or town councils. And um, similarly, when you get into uh, part 5b, uh, uh, it deals with the setting of council tax, or well, clearly town and parishes don't set council tax. There probably needs to be a sentence in there uh, when it does go to the parish and town councils to say those two um, or four paragraphs do not apply. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, th uh, thank you, Tony. Yeah, with regards to that, uh, we will send out guidance with the code when we send it out to the clerks. Um, on the scrutiny committee side, um, some town councils do do a slight um, pseudo uh, uh, scrutiny role, so some have kept it in. Um, with regards to the amendments, the rest of the amendments, we advise that it should be um, advice of the proper officer or the responsible finance officer. And then at the end, uh, we, we do say that that should be changed to precept. Uh, so we, we, we will advise the councils when, when we send it out. I'm obliged. Thank you. Professor Dean, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just a quick question, 2.11. Uh, it says that there will be a further review in the light of the statutory changes. Um, I just wonder if there's a time scale for the review um, and whether or not the review will be undertaken by the working group or the full standards committee, uh, given that the changes presumably are going to be limited. Um, um, with regards to time scales, uh, Professor Dean, no, I can't. Um, Get, um, tell you when at this stage. Um, I'm part of a monitoring officer working group with the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. There was a meeting due in March. This has now been put back to April. Um, we had been told originally uh, six months ago they would be consulting on the um, uh, new the, the changes to statute that will be coming. We're still awaiting that consultation. What we will do is we will circulate the consultation as we have done with the code to all standards committee members um, initially, and then it will really be then be for the committee to determine what route they would like it to go, um, whether they would like it just to go to the working party or the committee as a whole would like to discuss it. At some point, though, as with the code of conduct, it will come before the whole committee and the whole committee will have a chance to input to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Uh, any other further questions then, please, members? Will you indicate by putting an X in the box or the raise your hand feature? Again, as been pointed out uh, to you, as is also in the recommendation, um, if this uh, new revised code of conduct is approved today, which I'm sure it will be, it will then go forward to full council for their approval. Um, subject then, once that's been done, it will then go out to parish and, and town councils. Um, I'll read the recommendation to you then. There doesn't seem to be any other indications of anyone wishing to speak. The recommendation is that the code of conduct at the appendix to the report is recommended for council approval. I so proposed that recommendation and I asked if my vice chair is happy to second. I'm very happy to second that chair. Thank you. We will then go to the vote, Angela, please. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Alvey. Four. Councillor Frank. Four. Councillor Jenkin. Four. Nicholas. Four. Two. Four. Councillor Wills. Four. And that's been carried unanimously, Chairman. Thank you, Angela. On to uh, agenda item number four, local government and social care ombudsman LG uh, SCO decision report on Cornwall Council's response, reference number 19004581, which is on pages 20 to 42 of your um, agenda packs. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that Suzanne uh, Wixie is uh, with us this afternoon. Uh, Suzanne will um, present the report to the committee. Suzanne, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm hoping that I'm sharing my dis desktop with you. Can you see the presentation in front of you? No. Yes? No, not yet. No, we, no. we can see you, but we can't see uh, any Okay, report. just bear with me. It's all right. Take, take your time. That's yep. much better. Yep. Come through now. Okay. Okay, that's great. Thank you uh, very much indeed. So um, I've managed to lose it off my screen now, which isn't helpful. Just bear with me. Is it still showing? It's yes. showing, but it's not showing a slideshow. It's showing the side slides. OK, just bear with me then. OK, you should be seeing it in all its glory now, hopefully. Um, so from the beginning in terms of uh, the presentation. So this is a presentation in relation to the Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman Investigation Decision Report into a complaint against uh, Cornwall Council. Um, so this report is going to cover uh, the complaint, uh, the findings, uh, the lessons learned, the remedies and the recommendations from the Health Overview um, and Scrutiny Committee uh, yesterday. Um, so the Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman published a report relating to an investigation into a complaint against Cornwall Council on the 4th of February 2021. This is Appendix 1 of your report. The Ombudsman found evidence of fault causing injustice to Mrs D and recommendations were made to this long-standing case which was dating back uh, to 2017. The Ombudsman has published this report because they consider it is in the public interest to do so given the fault and the injustice caused to the complainant and the Council's initial refusal to make the suggested payment. The Council has accepted the findings of the Ombudsman report and agreed to undertake the actions described to remedy that injustice. This will provide a satisfactory remedy to the complaint. So the purpose of this report is to provide um, the Standards Committee uh, th about the decision uh, report, uh, to provide a service response prior to the report being considered, which is being considered today, the 4th of March, to inform the committee with the actions taken as set out in paragraph 216 and provided evidence to the LGSO. And I would encourage people uh, to look at those paragraphs uh, to see the actual actions that have been taken. Sorry, Please. Suzanne, are you moving your slides on? Because they're not I, moving for us. I am moving my slides on, which we're, um, we're still on slide two. OK, um, I'm not sure how to make that happen then because they are moving on on mine. You might need to unshare and reshare. OK, just bear with me. Ah, that's moved. Ah, okay. So we're now on five. 
that's that's where we should be. Okay, we haven't seen three and four. Okay, would you like me to go back to three and four? Would that be helpful or are you happy with my Yeah, I think that would be helpful, Suzanne, please. Okay, so the purpose of, the, of this report um, is to provide uh, the Standards Committee uh, with the Ombudsman uh, Decision Report uh, to provide the service response prior to the report being considered by the Standards Committee today. So that is the committee uh, that is now receiving this report to inform the committee with the actions taken as set out in paragraph 216. And as I said, I would encourage the committee to look at those um, because there is quite significant evidence that has been provided uh, to, the, to the LGSO to inform the committee of the improvements to our policy practice and learning and opportunities for our staff. Um, the, also, the report will formally be considered on behalf of the Council at the Standards Committee today. Um, and although um, this was considered yesterday, uh, the outcome of the members' consideration of this report at this meeting will be reported. So this is what we're doing today. We're reporting the report that went to scrutiny yesterday to the Standards Committee today. Um, so the report summary, summary, Mrs D complains that the council, council should not have stopped her direct payment in August 2018. And Mrs D says the council should have also allowed her daughter who lived with her to remain a paid carer. Mrs D complains the council failed to put in a commission service uh, in place to provide her care when it stopped her direct payment. And because of this, her daughter was forced to continue to provide this care to her as an informal unpaid carer. Mrs D says the council also failed to support her daughter in her role as her informal carer. And Mrs D says that this resulted in significant distress to her and her daughter, as well as financial hardship to her daughter. The daughter could not take up any paid employment opportunities for herself, did not have enough breaks and therefore was unable to maintain her social life or interest. Mrs D also complains about the financial assessment that was carried out in November 2017, which resulted in a decision that she had to pay a contribution towards the cost of her care between November 2017 and December 2018. The findings the Ombudsman found fault when Council stopped the direct payment, even though Mrs D had provided the information the Council had asked for and without ensuring it had alternative care in place. The council had not yet carried out its needs assessment and had not yet identified a care agency who could take over her care as promised in 2018. The council also failed to tell her in August 2018 why it had decided this, so causing uncertainty and distress to Mrs D. The ombudsman did not find fault in regard to the financial assessment element of the complaint. It was not the fault of the council, did not include the cost of the dis disability related expenditure. So decisions and recommendation, the council has agreed to remedy the injustice, injustice caused by the faults and within four weeks of the date of the report. Apologies have been given to Mrs D and her daughter for the faults identified and the distress caused. Uh, payments have been made to Mrs D's daughter, an amount equivalent to what she had received if the council had continued to pay for her support she provided from January 2019 onwards until it found a care agency and offered Mrs D a commission care package in February 2020. Review at Mrs D circumstances and decide if the council should allow Mrs D a direct payment to pay her daughter to provide her care. If it is decides to refuse this, the council should provide a clear explanation in writing. Share with uh, its adult social care staff the lessons learned about when the council may consider it necessary to use direct payments to pay family members to provide care and how best to get medical evidence. And the Ombudsman also recommended that the council pay Mrs D and her daughter £500 each for the distress they had suffered since September 2018. The council did not initially agree to pay £500 to Mrs uh, D. These recommendations have all now uh, been put in place. There are potential legal implications arising from this report as if the Ombudsman is dissatisfied with the responses received from the Council, they may recommend further action and issue a further report. Additionally, if a similar complaint is upheld after the actions have been implemented, this could lead to increased sanctions. 
The report highlights issues the council need to be mindful of in the discharge of its legal responsibilities. The steps articulated in response to the LGSO findings should assist in avoiding similar issues and adverse findings. Uh, the portfolio, uh, uh, portfolio holder has been uh, updated and engaged uh, throughout this process. And again, sort of the, the matter will be considered at today's standard committee. In terms of financial um, implications, as a result of the Ombudsman decision, compensation to the amount of £1,000 has been paid, plus an amount equivalent to the amount that would have been received if the council had continued to pay for the care and support. This will be met uh, by the relevant service budgets. Um, so in summary, um, this was an incredibly complex case. Um, it had legal audit, many professionals and many organisations involved um, in uh, trying to resolve the issues uh, for Mrs D with the best endeavours to support Mrs D and her daughter through this process. However, on this occasion, the local authority um, has, has failed uh, to provide a consistent response and it has accepted the findings of the LGSO. It did give mitigating evidence to the LGSO, but this was not accepted. A sincere apologies and compensation has been given to the complainant. And finally, the recommendations, uh, Health and Adult Social Care Overview and Scrutiny Committee considered the report yesterday and the Council's response on the 3rd of March. And the recommendation was that actions taken by the Adult Social Care uh, Directorate and the learning arising from the Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman uh, report be endorsed and that this resolution be recommended to the Standards Committee when they consider the report on the 4th of March. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Uh, questions then, please, members. Any questions you have uh, on the report, uh, please indicate if you have questions by putting an X in the box or the raise your hand feature for those of you that don't have an X in the box. Um, Chairman, it's Angela from Democratic Services. I don't know if um, Suzanne Wixey wants to unshare her screen. I'm sure Suzanne can unshare her screen. I do have a question uh, that has come in from Tony Woodhams. Tony Woodhams, first of all, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, and thank you, Susanna Wicks. Uh, going, going through that, I see that the, the evidence of fault and injustice uh, that has been accepted by the uh, Cornwall Council, and they've agreed to undertake the um, actions to, in, to remedy that injustice. Um, what I'm concerned about really is how, how will the remedy, uh, I can understand that it will be remedied now, but how will you prevent a repetition of that? And the details of the remedy are found in paragraph uh, point nine. But whilst, whilst Cornwall Council has accepted the report and its recommendations and has actioned it, does not, in my opinion, satisfy uh, the requirement that there will not be a reoccurrence. If, if you're reading through uh, the LGSCO's uh, report and following the narrative of the evidence, uh, any reader would be compelled to agree with its findings uh, because of the quality of the reporting and the quality of the bookkeeping. What I'm asking really is, is the standard of bookkeeping and uh, record recording in the narrative kept by the um, uh, Social Care Directorate on the same standard? Because had it been at that standard, the conclusion would have been exactly the same as the investigator from the Ombudsman's uh, department, because it is plain, uh, painfully obvious. Um, I probably need to be reassured that the case files in that department are as robust and transparent as they ought to be uh, to avoid a repeat of that. And I do accept that the, the lessons have been learned and the actions recommended by the Ombudsman have been discharged uh, yesterday. But there would probably need to be assurance that um, all narratives and record keepings are robust enough to prevent an occurrence. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Suzanne, please. Okay, so just um, in terms of, sorry, there's a lot of feedback. Yeah, sorry, Tony, can you mute your microphone now you finish, please, mate, and switch off your uh, camera and that we will we'll try and maintain the bandwidth and then Suzanne can answer. Suzanne. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. So in, in relation to recording, so 
this case went back um, to uh, several years ago now, um, and the department um, information journey um, and has made uh, significant changes in terms of how it is uh, recording um, and through the lessons learned as um, has been stipulated in the report, have put in place a number of mechanisms to ensure that um, all the recording um, is, is correct. However, what I would say is that this is a very complex case. It is a unique case and individuals who receive adult social care are unique in themselves. Um, and in relation to that, sort of, um, it is difficult to say it might not never happen again. Um, so every attempt has been made to tighten up uh, the processes, tighten up the recording, um, auditing um, have also sort of been involved. And as I said, legal have also been involved in this case. And we are now in a position sort of where we are, are uh, have greater clarity and greater audit uh, around direct payments than we did uh, when this complaint was first made. So I think what you're saying, Suzanne, is that you are um, content that the procedures now put in place as a result of the report um, should hopefully not allow a similar situation like this to happen again. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Councillor Frank, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Suzanne. That was very clear in your report. My question was actually, I put my little X in there before Tony started speaking. It was really similar to what Tony was, uh, the points Tony was making about the lessons learned. But I'm satisfied with your um, uh, response, Suzanne, and thank you for all the work you've done in it. Just a really small question related to that, though. So at yesterday's overview and scrutiny committee, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to attend, but um, could you feed back what their comments were? Please, were they satisfied as well? Did they, did they raise any points that we should be made aware of? Um, in terms of the feedback, the only thing that was said was that, and there are other councillors on the call that might want to um, uh, update on that, um, which might be helpful. Um, you know, sort of they discussed it, and the recommendation was around, uh, particularly, um, you know, sort of what uh, has been presented here. Uh, in this case, it was very clear sort of that obtaining information across agencies uh, was quite difficult. Um, so I think sort of in relation to that, we need to think about moving forward, how we make that information exchange uh, more readily available across organisations. Um, and that was a further area that they uh, did, did raise. Um, but that, I believe, unless my uh, other councillors on the call, want to add anything into that? Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Councillor Jenkins, please. Yeah, well, I'm one of the ones who was at the meeting yesterday. So, yeah, one, one of the issues that's raised, which is on our page uh, 25, was the difficulty of getting information from external agencies. And um, I think probably what had been happening, although um, is that if an email hadn't been received, they assumed there was no information rather than chasing it um, and chasing it maybe by telephone, particularly I think GPs we discussed a bit yesterday about the different email systems across the, the, the GPs and consultants and how to get the information out of them that's required, particularly in terms of health issues. But the, the key issue was around ensuring that if different people in different agencies or different parts of the council are dealing with something that it all gets recorded in a common system so that um, whoever whoever picks up, picks up a case if somebody moves on and somebody else comes over it all the information is there in one place and I think that's a an ongoing journey that adult social care is still um, working on and um, certainly the the Standards Committee have got a watching brief to look at um, how this is going to improve in the future. Um, this case dates back to 2017, but there were still faults happening in 2018 um, yeah. and it was only resolved in 2021. So, you know, we can do better than that, I think, probably. Um, and uh, that's not to, um, you know, 
criticise the journey that adult social care has been on. It is moving in the right direction, but we still within the working party have felt that there's uh, a bit of a way to go yet. So um, that's why we asked the standards committee to keep that working party going into the new administration. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to pick up on any of those points, Susanna? Are you happy with that? I'm happy with that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Nicholas, please. Sue. Hi. Well, I'm the other one that was on the committee list today. <laughs> and um, yeah, it, it was, um, there was quite a significant amount of discussion about the IT systems and how you actually access information from various IT systems. I mean, we've got system one, we've got EMS, we've got, uh, I forget, Microsoft, is it? Or Microtest or whatever it is. So I think that was the issue, wasn't it, Suzanne, that, that you can't necessarily get information. I know the GPs are changing. Certainly my GP is changing from waiting room to patient says, I think it is, so that you can access a lot more of your own information via the internet. Um, and so that was quite a significant thing and it's something that's been a problem throughout the country it's not just local I mean I, some of my CQC inspections you know there's been problems where somebody can't communicate or pick up information from someone else so it's it is something that's quite significant um, the other one that I raised was training and it was about duty of candor and about how people feel comfortable with doing that and you know admitting that things have gone wrong and doing something about it and it's not just about online training because I think online training is so easy to do you know and they're isolated quite often on their own so I think we should encourage as well physical training so that people actually meet on a training day so that they can discuss issues that they might have had and that they can physically look at case studies amongst themselves because I think there's quite an awful lot of value about learning from other people's mistakes or things like that yeah. so I think that's something we should really encourage as well but thank you Suzanne and for all you've done for the, the system and the council. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Reg Davison. Reg please. Thank, thank you Chair. Um, a lot of the things that gave rise to concern for me have already been answered by by you, Suzanne, and by um, and by the questioning. But there are a couple of other things that I'm interested in. Um, was it the, the learning and and the failure that has been identified? Was it individual? Was it a depart? Was it a team decision? Uh, how, how are you dealing with? with that failure as part of your lessons learned it would be one question another question is there's mention in the report about prospective care agents i'm and whether they were in suitable in this case or not but in a, in a general sense when you are considering care agents what level of vetting is there of that that organization, how rigorous is that process? And the other thing is more a comment than a question. Um, it, and I think it's been touched on is the audit trail of the actions taken by your staff when dealing with any case. Um, it, hopefully they, they keep better records so that in the event of any subsequent investigation, the answers are already there. Um, but perhaps you can answer the first two questions, please. Thank you. OK, uh, can I take the middle uh, one first? So the one is around uh, the suitable care agencies. So all our care agencies are vetted. Uh, they have to come onto a framework and part of that framework is they need to be registered with CQC um, and uh, we uh, ensure that they are um, a, a good provider. Um, and they are not just uh, financially stable, but also sort of um, are able to deliver care uh, that is, a, is of an appropriate standard. So I hope that answers uh, that, that question. Um, in terms of learning from the failure, um, there, there, there are several elements from that. And if you look at the report, you will see uh, from 2.16, uh, 
the response, and it's been a comprehensive response from the service about what they will take forward um, as actions from the lessons learned. Um, and that will be audited as well. So you will be aware, um, I believe, um, in relation to direct payments, uh, there has been um, an audit report as well that has also been done. Um, and our arrangements, uh, particularly in relation to this case and uh, direct payments in general, um, we will uh, ensure uh, that these are audited and the learning um, is taken on board and we will intervene um, and uh, ensure that our staff are both trained and developed appropriately to be able to respond. What I would reiterate is um, you, within the report, you have a, a synopsis of the case. It was an incredibly complex case and it has left us uh, asking uh, some further questions, uh, particularly, um, and I was just talking to Helen Charlesworth May before I came on the call, uh, we are going to take another step and use it as a safeguarding case study as well, because um, in relation to mental capacity, we need to be very clear um, what we do when somebody has capacity um, and potentially sort of when they do not want to engage with us. Uh, we also sort of want to look at when we offer care and um, that is not accepted because in terms of our statutory duties, we have fulfilled our legal obligation. We will also sort of be looking at that as well. And when a direct payment is not being used appropriately, the mechanisms that we take um, and the approach that we take uh, when that is happening. So, as I said, it's a very complex case. There's lots of learning from it. We are addressing the learning. We will audit uh, going forward. Uh, to provide uh, as much assurance as possible uh, for the future in, in cases such as these. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. Oh, sorry, thank you. sorry, Chair. May, may I just want to come back, Reg? Yes, yeah, sorry. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I, I fully understand how difficult, how complex this case has been on reading of the Ombudsman report, uh, which gives rise to, for me, all sorts of issues about the assessment of the Ombudsman as well as the conduct of the Council, but that's not what I want to discuss. I My question about um, learning comes from my reading of your paragraph 216, and um, I still am interested to know whether, and I'm not asking for you to name any names or anything like that, but did did you find that it was just an individual uh, failing? Did you find that it was a team train uh, failing? And ultimately, ultimately, who is responsible? OK, so it was uh, several teams, as I, as I have explained. Um, several teams, um, everybody played a part uh, in, in this. Um, so whether it was our business support teams or whether it was our assessment teams, um, or whether it was our partner agencies. And I think sort of that's that that's the issue for me. Um, if you said, was there one point of failure? No, there wasn't one point of failure. Um, and I think that's really, really important to note. Um, and, you know, sort of, as I've said, sort of, you know, going, going forward, um, we will ensure that we close those gaps um, and that uh, we are not in the same position again. Um, in relation to that. Okay, I hope that's answered your question now, Reg. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Suzanne. Th th thank you, Chair. You're, no, you're very welcome. Councillor Jenkins, please. Update? Yeah, sorry, I was just waiting to see if anyone else had anything to say, because um, I'd be happy to move the recommendation. Um, but it would be quite good to have something in the recommendation which flags up the continuing work of the working party on adult social care into the new authority. So perhaps if we could put some wording in to, to that effect, because although lessons are learned, what, we, what we've said within the working party is we need to monitor that the lessons that are learned um, are the system is adjusted to ensure that 
we don't get system failure in the future. And one of the things that our, our working party were particularly keen on is looking at the, the data recording and the the way that um, uh, adult social care are able to share information between different teams and different elements, both within the council and the agencies outside. And that's the bit we're not entirely convinced yet, but is completely in place. We need to see the results of what's been put in place um, and what software systems are being used uh, and those sorts of things. I think a bit more of a deep dive. That's not words, but Rob's come on the call, so perhaps um, he can come up with some suitable <laughs> words. I'm just fiercely scribbling away, but um, Rob, um, the floor is yours now. If you wish to ask a question or add to that, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, yes, I'm sorry to interject uh, because it, uh, what I have to say actually ties in with what you were saying, uh, Loveday. Um, and I, I agree with some of the uh, other speakers that have gone before. Um, I think I have a lot of empathy with the department um, and the staff, all the staff who've dealt with this case because it's not been easy and there's been a lot of obfuscation, I would, uh, is the word I would use which has not helped you solve the problem. Having said that, whilst reading the papers, I wondered if anyone ever asked at the very beginning of this is, could this complaint have been prevented? And if the answer to that is yes, this is where it comes in with you, Love Day. I agree, the working group must get to the bottom of it and think strategically. It's a strategic problem that needs to be solved. And Tony kind of, uh, mentioned that really. Um, in, on the page 28 at 10.1, you have the recommendations there um, and what are uh, the options available. And when we come to those options, I believe we should be beefing up the third one. And I'll stop there for the moment if you're happy, Chair. Yeah, that's fine. What I what I've written um, to add to recommendation one, where it says appendix one, and I've written the working party continued to monitor the adult social com uh, care complaints and ensure that lessons are, are learned are acted upon. Um, is that suitable to you, Love Day? You're muted, sweetheart. Yeah, that, that sounds reasonable. I mean, you know, the, the referring the matter to the working party, the working party at the moment is still in existence, but actually putting in refer to might might actually be helpful, bearing in mind we are changing authorities potentially post election. Right, OK, so uh, something on the lines of the working party continue to monitor adult social care complaints mm -hmm. and referrals to them. And, and that this should be part of the referrals to them. All right, and this and this should be part. Let me just write that down. And this should be part of the referrals to the working party. Yeah, in order to monitor the effectiveness of the actions taken. Yeah, to ensure that lessons learned are acted upon. Yeah. yeah. So it will read uh, recommendation one. Um, the standards committee be appraised to the local government social care ombudsman decision report in respect of the investigation into a complaint against Cornwall Council 1900481 appendix one and the working party continue to monitor adult social uh, com uh, care complaints and this should be part uh, of the can't read my own handwriting there part of the recommendations to the working party uh, and ensure that lessons learned are acted upon. I think we have to have the endorse bit in there as well. We endorse this, the response so far. And That's then, on part two, isn't it? Yeah. That's on part two. That, and then yeah. obviously the second part is that the Standards Committee endorsed the response of the Adult Social Care Director yeah. detailing the recommendation actions taken by Adult Social Care and the learning arising from the Local Government Social Care Ombudsman Report. Yeah. Happy with that. I'm happy yeah. with that. OK, uh, Councillor uh, Nicholas, Sue, you wish to come back? 
Yeah, no, I, th I think they're fine. It's just a, a query, and it's probably because we've just been bogged down with so many virtual meetings, my brain's getting out all. Um, did we get confirmation, um, love Dave, that um, the working party, we were talking about them putting a system in the same or very similar to the children's one so that things didn't get missed. Do we know whether that actually happened? Yeah, this was whether they were going to use the mosaic system yeah. mosaic to get children's or not. Um, mm. I haven't had an answer to that, and I'm not sure if Suzanne is able to answer it at this point. Nice. But it was certainly something we were considering in within the working party, and they were looking at considering it. Yeah, it just <laughs> dawned on me, we actually hadn't had anything back on that. I'm not aware of um, that. So. Okay. okay. It's 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 something that the working party needs to um, you know, get into more. I think. Um, okay. Ellie is. Ellie, yeah, does Ellie? Did you want to come in on that? Yeah, just obviously we haven't had a, a working party meeting for a while for obvious reasons. Um, Love day, if you could indicate when you would li next like to meet, that'd be really helpful. And, and secondly, obviously prior to that next meeting, I can obviously chase up any recommendations that were priorly made and just give, you know, give everyone a heads up prior to the meeting taking place. Yeah, I mean, this this is my concern, Ellie, because obviously we're going into PERDA and election relatively soon. So I'm not sure that we'll be able to do that before before that period. We have got um, it timetabled on our um, July standards meeting, I think, um, you know, to reinvigorate. Um, and I think the idea was to then look at how things had been achieved by, by then from memory. But Simon might be able to. Yeah. Simon. Simon, I see you got your hand up. Uh, yeah, I can confirm to, for, for the benefit of members and sort of preempting the next meeting really, but I have included this into the work plan for the standards committee. So it, it gives the standards committee when it meets in July an idea of what the committee now would, would consider a suitable work programme for 2021 to 2022. Mm -hmm. Lovely, that's I, great. I just Rob, wondered if it needed sorry. to be added to one of the recommendations so that it doesn't disappear. I don't think it will. If it's in the uh, work programme, it should be fine, actually, Sue, okay. I think. Yeah, uh, Rob, do you want to come back in, Rob Bishop? Yes, Mr Chair, if I may. Um, I think to be a bit fairer to the adult social care uh, staff, um, we could broaden that slightly. Um, I, I put some words together before you came up with yours there, and I'm not going to say yours are wrong, Paul, um, but I say the working group aim being to confirm there is a robust organisation in place to prevent successive complaints to the LGSCO. OK, so uh, do you want to replace my wording with yours? Is that what you're saying? I, uh, I'm looking at uh, Love Day. She's nodding a little bit. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting a slightly um, uh, Zoom dead in terms of what order we're doing these things. So um, yeah, OK, OK. Well, let's, I, let's I like, I like some words. I think yeah. we need to have something about endorsing what's been done so far. Yeah. Um, and then referring um, okay. to the working group for more detailed work. Well, um, Suzanne, well, well, Suzanne's going to come back to us on that. Rob, can you write something in the sidebar then for me for us, please? Yeah, I'll put that in there and then send put it. Put that in there now and then we've got that and then it's there for Angela as well. Suzanne, you wish to come back on that? Yes, thank you, Chair. Just in terms of, I just think we need to be clear, clear. in terms of complaints, so complaints can be seen as a bad thing and at times they are not good things, but actually we should, uh, you know, sort of in, in, encourage people if they are not satisfied to make, make a complaint. So what I don't want to do is get to the position sort of where we stop the normal complaint process and going to the LGO sometimes is a good use of the LGO uh, in terms of them looking inwards on what we're doing. Um, so in terms of excessive complaints going to the LGO, sort of I just I just think we need to be mindful and be careful. Sort of what we're not trying to do is stunt uh, that that process. I just yeah, and I'm I just I think we just need to be careful about the wording. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, if I can come back, Chair, just to clarify that. I mean that there's a there's a historic issue with 
a lot of historic adult social care complaints. And one of the things that the working party identified was that there was a lack of joined up communication within adult social care that was causing some of the issues and that issues should have been dealt with at a lower level and shouldn't have needed to go to the LGSCO. Um, and that's where okay. the, the monitoring is needed to see whether that's improved. Okay. Tony, Tony Williams, you wish to come back. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Um, it's just a quick one, really. Um, I think mixing up a couple of issues here, one of the things that you're looking at is to try to find a way to ensure that the working party is retained at the next mm -hmm. council and to investigate make recommendations, a robust and efficient narrative is in place um, to ensure um, that the social care directorate is these, these bits and pieces already just discussed that it's um, in action to the recommendations they've put in place. Further action with this committee going forward into the next council, I thought which you're, you're looking at. Uh, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. That makes sense. Well, let's look at the recommendations then, uh, folks. The recommendations are, um, and I will read them out now. Hopefully, um, dear Rob is going to stick something in the sidebar quite soon. Uh, here we go. Thanks, Rob. That's great. Uh, the recommendation, recommendation one, is that the standards committee be appraised to the local government social care. Oh, Chairman, sorry, decision. can I just interrupt you there? I don't think there's a need for a recommendation one because it's saying that the standards committee be appraised, which is what is happening today. So personally, I'd be tempted to leave that out completely and focus on the second one and maybe and tweak that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Right. Happy with that. So the Standards Committee endorsed the response of adult social care directorate detailing the recommendation, uh, recommended actions taken by adult social care and the learning arising from the local government social care ombudsman's report with the working party aim being to confirm there is a robust organisation uh, in place to prevent successive complaints to the uh, LGSCO. And that, I think, I, I think that need a couple of joining words which is and refer the lessons learned to the working group i like that yes and yeah. refer the lessons learned to the working group which which will continue its aim of being yeah okay yeah happy with that angela have you got that yes i have Excellent. OK, so um, if members are happy with that now, we I, I will propose. Love day, you happy to second? Yeah, happy to second. Great. Uh, and let's go to the vote, please. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Alvey. Four. Frank. Four. Councillor Jenkin. Four. Nicholas. Four. Councillor Pugh. Four. Councillor Wilms. Four. Anonymous Chairman. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Suzanne, uh, very much indeed uh, for your time this afternoon. Um, I know it's been difficult. And as you say, each complaint is, you know, in its own, uh, has its own merits and, and they can be more difficult some than others. Um, but uh, we appreciate your time this afternoon uh, uh, with the committee. Um, there being no other further business of the committee, um, I now declare the meeting officially closed and I thank members again for their time. Um, continue please to stay safe everybody. Um, hopefully we'll all be meeting again in a few weeks time um, and I look forward to seeing you all then. So do take care and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Chair. Bye. Well, Chaired. Bye. Thank you.